Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for watching Trey Mason Dasan and joining us tonight for this discussion. We're, we're delighted you're with us. We first met Denali and Rebecca four years ago, and we were so impressed by both them and by the footage that they showed us that Shine did go on to co-produce the film. Um, and we had a chance to meet Liz a couple of years ago at a screening. And uh, I can tell you that the Osborne Association has been uh, it's just so important, not only to the completion of the film, but to its outreach and social engagement. And Mason, this is really only our second time talking. And uh, we, were, we were talking a little bit about uh, uh, Mason's experience in doing Q and A's before we got started. So he's, he's, uh, he's an old hand at this. And Mason, you won our heart in this film and we are so happy that you're with us tonight. So. Let's get started. Um, Denali, I'm gonna throw the first question to you. How did you first become interested in making a film about incarcerated parents? And how did you choose Trey, Mason, and Dasan as your subjects? Yeah, of course. Hi everybody, and thank you so much, Shine and Susan and Alex for putting this together. We're really excited to be here. Um, so this film began in 2014 or wait yeah 2014 um when I was a just going into my senior year of college and this actually began as my senior thesis project so I had met a woman who became a close friend her name is Joyce Dixon Haskin she's actually briefly in the film um she's a social worker that's talking to Trey and his mom and she was incarcerated for 17 years so she had three kids when she went in, two kids when she went in who were six and eight years old and 23 and 25 when she came out. And, um, you know, her, they, both of her kids had very different experiences when she was gone. Um, but one of them is, unfortunately, her oldest son is still in prison serving a life sentence. So when she got out, her main, she got her master's in social work and her really, her main focus um, within her work was looking at what had happened to her kids and all children of incarcerated parents. And what she realized is that, um, you know, there's a lot of services for kids um, who have, you know, drug and alcohol abuse problems in the home, who suffer from homelessness, who um, have divorced parents, all of these kind of adverse childhood experiences, but there was nothing for her kids who had a parent in prison. And in fact, not only was there no support, but there was actually a stigma placed on them and they were turned away from, you know, friends' homes. They were ridiculed or judged at school by teachers and by their peers. And so she realized that there was a real hole for so many children um, in the U.S. and her kids included that had incarcerated parents. Um, so she developed, she ended up developing this psychological model called LORT, Levels of Response to Traumatic Events that really goes deeply into um, the, those kind of the, the um, psychological um, effects of parental incarceration on children. And so long story short, I was really fascinated and interested in her work and her story is just incredible. So I began this film kind of about, it was going to be about her and um, looking for sort of these case studies to follow um, through this LORT program. So through that work, I met Trey and Mason first when I went to the visiting hours. And I think we just immediately connected. And, um, you know, I don't, I know Mason doesn't mind me sharing the story of the first time I met him and you were nine. <laughs> so feels like forever ago, but um, he came up and said, hey I, I knew you were you know making this film and I heard you're making this film and I actually have a production company and I would love <laughs> to um I would love to help produce and so we're like absolutely um and actually we created a short film that TT Media Trace or Mason's nine-year-old production company was was the co-producer of um but in any case as I started working with these kids and we got closer I just really realized that if there was any story to be told about children who experience parental incarceration, it really had to come from them personally and through their eyes. And so, you know, Joyce was kind of this leading catalyst into 
my own, you, you know, uh, exploration of this topic and real discovery of, of these children and what they're going through. And then Trey Mason and Dasan, um, it's their film, you know, they, they are filmmakers alongside me and, and really making it, it their own stories. Um, and so for each of them, you know, I think I connected with Trey and Mason first, um, just because they were in the men's facility in the, in the visiting hours. Um, told you the story of Mason, but Trey um, similarly was, was, I worked closely with the social workers in the program, so they had sort of pointed him out as a child who is just getting to know his father again after many years. And so you sort of really follow that um, kind of trajectory of their relationship through the film. And um, we became very close. And then um, Dasan, we met about a year later when we got access to the women's facility. It actually met his mom first. And then um, that's really, as you saw, you know, a story of a parent coming home and what that transition is like and um, what that means for kids. And then very importantly for him, you know, that conversation about the truth, you know, that it's very common that that parents will just be too ashamed to tell their kids or be honest with their kids that they are in prison. So they'll say they're in the military, they're at university, they're in school, um, they're at work upstate. And so we felt that that conversation and that story was really, really important to um, just help understand that dynamic. Um, I think and it's, so, it's so great that you included a Stephanie story and that we, we get to see exactly what you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, what happens upon the homecoming. Uh, Mason, so when, when Denali, when you first met Denali, did you know right away that you wanted to be in the film or was your dad, Manny, uh, at all a force for bringing you aboard? How did that happen? I remember just going into the, the visit and uh, the, the Nolly was there and said that, I think my dad first mentioned that like, oh, I think, I think they're uh, doing like some sort of documentary thing. And then I was like, really? And then I, was like, yeah. <laughs> I just went over and I was like, oh, can I be in your movie? And then she said, sure. And then but I think at first like dad and like kind of my, my, we were a little like, eh, I don't know. But then obviously now, like it's been like a life changing experience. And I'm really glad that I took that opportunity to do it. Yeah, we'll come back and talk about this again uh, in, a, in a few minutes, but I, I have to say that the decision that you made to be part of this, Mason, it's, it's certainly life-changing for you and Manny and your grandmother. Um, it's going to be life-changing for a lot of people who watch the film too, so thank you for, for making that choice. Um, uh, um, Denali, so you You've met, then known the kids since for about six years, and how how would you just describe your relationships with them today? Well, really, the film. I mean, I I have to preface this by saying I was not a you know I'm I was not a filmmaker when I started this project. I was a student. I had no idea how to make a film, and so I'm really grateful actually for that because I think that I was able to connect with them in a way that was not it it really wasn't like subject and and filmmaker mm -hmm. it really was a relationship off the bat and that's something i will carry with me throughout my filmmaking career and i think you know there's sort of this push and pull between um documentary filmmaking and journalism and i don't think that my relationship with the boys um you know i got some pushback from more of the journalist side of filmmaking um, but we are, I would say we're really close, you know, and we were close throughout the film. Um, and even today, you know, three years after the film premiered, um, I'm in touch with the boys pretty regularly. And um, I, I talk to their parents pretty often and um, just am always there. And I think that that, um, especially for Trey, who, you know, he, and if you saw the film, he was already struggling with the loss of his father um, and, and their relationship. And then he lost his mother, you know, in the process of making the film. And it really became apparent to me that the, the film was really the most consistent thing in his life for those years. 
And so there's a tremendous responsibility that comes with that. Um, and so I, I think that that's something I recognized and just realized like this is a huge responsibility and I need to take this seriously and I need to, you know, have the support from folks that are much more experienced and knowledgeable about um, these kids and what they may be going through, um, but also the community and then just having our relationship. So it wasn't always serious going in and making a movie, you know, we would go and play games or Trey and I ate a lot of McDonald's and <laughs> kind of like be kids together, you know, and that, that was really fun. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, Liz, um, Alex alluded to this, some of this in her introduction of you, but um, when we first talked on the phone a couple of weeks ago, I was so touched by your backstory and, and uh, uh, what you shared with us um, uh, around your work uh, stemming from Attica, but also your personal relationship and how this really informed your, your career choices and brought you to the Osborne Association. Do you mind sharing a little more about that with us? I don't. Um, I don't mind at all because I think so many people end up where they are by accident. And I really was an accidental tourist in prisons. I just happened to be um, in law school in Syracuse, New York, 49 years ago um, when the Attica Prison Rebellion happened, which, I mean, half the world now doesn't remember it, but it was earth shattering in that uh, state troopers fired what, you know, military weapons into the yard and by the retaking of the rebellion at the end of it, there were 43 people dead. And it attracted an enormous number of civil rights lawyers and people who wanted to go in and make some kind of difference. I think it was the first time that a lot of people in the world realized how many people we incarcerate how many of them are people of color and how stupid that system is. And so I just sort of volunteered as a law student and was kind of overcome by what I saw. I always thought people in prison were somehow not like the rest of us. Um, and it turned out, of course, that I met people who were brilliant and creative and um, had lived really hard lives. And so, um, after doing the legal work for a while, I realized that um, maybe being a lawyer wasn't the best way to go, but I, I, I ended up marrying somebody who had been incarcerated and was then, my kids were two and six and um, when he was arrested and suddenly having worked as a service provider or a lawyer inside, I suddenly had the experience of being a family member. Mm -hmm. um, and visiting a prison, same, same place, but a very different experience. Um, and I got a very clear view of the limits of the law. So I became a sort of recovering lawyer and reached out to a place like Osborne Association in New York City, which was very small at the time. Mm -hmm. But because I had worked in that system as a lawyer and knew folks there and was watching my kids at those ages feeling stigmatized and really punished in the school systems that they were in, um, I thought I could, we could do better than this. And so I, somehow they let me start a program, a parenting program for incarcerated fathers um, and eventually opened family centers and visiting rooms. Um, all of this in New York state, which did my own kids no good since their dad was incarcerated in Virginia for 25 years. Um, so it was a great contrast between what we were able to do in New York and my own family's experience, but it was still informed by that and be able to really see in, in, a, in a number of ways how kids were affected. Um, very few at the time, there were no programs like LORT or anything where kids were even allowed necessarily to touch their parents. It was my, one of my favorite scenes in that whole movie is when kids are playing catch in the visiting room, a kid was playing catch in the visiting room with his dad. And I'm going, what planet exactly is that? Um, people have to remember this isn't the general experience of incarceration or children of incarceration, yeah. but we've been very fortunate in New York to be able to do some programming. 
and, and it sounds like it's making a tremendous difference. Mason, you've had to deal with a lot of loss and change in your life, but with, uh, first with your parents' separation and then your dad's incarceration. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you feel you've learned about yourself from having to, to deal with these pretty, really very disruptive life circumstances? Um, I'm not really sure what I've like learned about myself, but like, I know like for like for a while, like the first few years of like my dad being in prison, like up until I was probably like nine, eight or nine, I thought like, oh, he's, he's just in naughty school. Cause that's what he used to, like, to call it. Cause I, for a while, I didn't even realize it was prison. I, I just called it naughty school. But then that realization, like that, it like, like that it wasn't, no, it wasn't just like a school, it was a prison and that he would be there for like a long time. That eventually like hit me and it hit me like pretty hard. Um, but like over, I mean, like even though I got used to like him being in prison, it never fully like, like it was always really hard. Like not, not being, like not being able to call, like call him, for example, having to wait for him to call me, only having 20 minute calls. But like what I've learned about myself so I think I think I've learned that um, like uh, I'm not really sure that's a tough question. Uh, might have to get back to me on this one. I don't know. <laughs> think about it. I have to say that my single favorite scene, most favorite scene in the film, is the Valentine's Day when when you had such a great day and uh, uh, and your father called and. You told them about it. And he, the relief you <laughs> just like every parent in the world could relate to that. I was that was so wonderful. So. Yeah, I had to fight you, Mason, to get that scene in the film, and that's my <laughs> favorite scene. <laughs> I'm glad you won, Denali, because it's really it's it's just it's just so wonderful. So, um, and you know, I, 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 in preparation for tonight, I've been thinking a lot about you Denali and your relationship with the kids. Um, and, uh, you, you know, over the 15 years that Shine has existed, we've, we've uh, been incredibly fortunate to work with wonderful, caring, very talented directors. I, I can't think of a single film we've done that, that I uh, wasn't really impressed by the directors that we worked with. But I have to say, that you're unique in the in in how you viewed the your your um, your subjects Trey Mason and Desan and how you were absolutely clear that this film was 100% a collaboration between you and and them and you treated them as partners mm -hmm. um, and I've I've actually never quite seen that before so um, you know why do you think what, what's that about, <laughs> I guess, is what I would ask. Probably not knowing anything about filmmaking, <laughs> but I'm just going to turn some more in the light here. It's like gotten a bit darker as we've been talking. Um, yeah, no, I think it's it was a very human response, first of all, of just, and there was a lot of learning that went into it, you know, of, um, but there, at the core of it, there was just this feeling of that this is not, I don't know anything about this. You know, I don't have a parent in prison. I've never experienced, you know, anybody I love very, you know, close to me being incarcerated for mm -hmm. a significant amount of time. And, um, and so to go in and like be telling other people's stories never felt right. Um, and so from the beginning, it just felt it felt like a learning experience of that they were teaching me and that the film was really a reflection of that um, and not that I was like taking and, you know, distilling their stories into something that people could recognize because that just didn't make sense. So, but then, you know, formally that it took the four years that we spent making the film to kind of figure out what that, that was. Um, technically and formally and and a lot of what went into that was a deep exploration and understanding of myself as a 
white woman um, and the implications of that and responsibility of that coming into the space um, with a camera that is could be easily, you know, weaponized or, or manipulated um, and just feeling like I needed to give as much power as possible over, not only because that felt like the responsible thing to do, but also because that's what I could give back. That's really what I, I had those resources. I had the camera equipment, I had the audience, I had the time to spend fundraising and creating this thing and finding partners to you know, amplify um, Trey, Mason and Dasan. And then not, not just have them feel like, oh cool, there was a film made about us, but that, oh, my music is on display. You know, Mason's had his artwork purchased by people and his, you know, Dis Dasan and his mom have, they published a children's book through the film. And so I really wanted to use um, my kind of, the resources that I had access to through all of you know my breadth of privilege to um, to just give that all over and and say what can we do together um, and so that's I can't say it was like something I decided to do it was definitely a learning process and figuring out what you know how to even talk about it because it just felt like the natural thing but um, that's how it ended up. Thank you. Uh, I just want to remind the audience that if you want to start. Uh, thinking about any questions that you have for Denali, Liz, and Mason, uh, please start sending them in. I have a few more questions I'm gonna ask now myself, but then we, we do wanna to get to yours as well. Um, Mason, uh, what was the hardest part of your dad's incarceration for you? For me, the hardest part was uh, always like just, like being at home and wanting so badly to just see him, just like give him a hug, just like mm -hmm. talk to him and not being able to like, not, like wanting to be able to call him and just like talk for like three hours, but not being able to. And that was like, that was definitely the hardest part. And I'm so, I, I, I'm so grateful right now for the fact that he's out and now I'm able to like, uh, Dude, I'm able to call him and be like, hey, sup, dad. I, whenever I call him, I say, hey, padre. Hey. <laughs> but like, just, but, uh, just, just being able to, like, not, not, not being able to call him was just, like, really, really hard and painful. And, uh, you know. Do you have any sense of what might have been the hardest part of incarceration for him? I think for him, it was probably, uh, I think it was, probably this part of it was the same thing like not like like not being able to see me whenever he wants but I think also for him I think the biggest part of it is like 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 regret for going to prison and like not like like I think he because I think a lot of times he, he would like like he would always be himself up over like not like being like not being able to spend time with me with like my nana and I think I think to some extent he still does, but that was probably the hardest part. And uh, yeah, yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. And just real, uh, very quickly before we move on, how's how's your grandmother doing? She's doing she's doing good. Yeah, she's going to she's going to work. Oh. <laughs> yeah, she's yeah. going to work every day at BJ's, and uh, she's uh, she's. Doing, she's doing the the the, the essential work, and she says she said it's 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 just I'm very grateful that she's people like people like her are out there doing the jobs that like like that we need doing because like she, like unfortunately she has to deal with some pretty like bad customers and some of it. But oh. you know. would you please tell your dad and your grandmother that we all send them a hug? I will. Um, Liz, uh, the Osborne Association provides uh, services to uh, individuals involved in different ways in the penal system, and you you have just an uh, kind of a, a, a staggeringly impressive uh, um, range of programs. Um, listening to what Mason is saying, could you tell us some of the ways that the Osborne Association tries to ease the problems that Mason and his dad and 
Trey and um, and Dasan and and Stephanie and and um, Trey's dad have experienced. Yeah, well, and oddly, it's not really about easing people's time. It's about empowering them to make choices, which is what I liked kind of about Denali's approach to the film, which is to give voice to people um, and empower people and, and particularly young people. You know, children of incarcerated parents, we would say are like all other children. They're also like some other children and in some ways they are like no other children. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a perception that they are, which is completely wrong, uh, that they are somehow more likely to go to prison than other kids. They're actually not. They do have other adverse experiences as a result of that stigma. I remember when my kid's dad went to prison, the, her friend's parents canceled her play dates. Like somehow this had something to do with them. So we, we bring children together, um, young people together so that they really get a sense that they're not alone. Um, which is why the, the program in the film was important is, is even just visiting, you look around, it, it's not the main message, but I think um, Trey and Mason both got this, they could see that other kids had this experience, which is, it's a very isolating one. You can feel in your school or in certain groups, you feel like I'm alone, people are looking at me, um, which is kind of how their parents feel when they come home as well, right? Is feeling isolated. So I think that that's, part of our goal and really keep keeping people connected. So we have video visiting or bring kids to prisons. We established family centers inside of visiting rooms. We're lucky we don't have two hour programs. We have all day visiting in New York. Well, it's somewhat with COVID restricted, but um, you know, within visiting rooms, we have these centers where um, kids can visit, but also it's, um, it's empowering the kids to, we have a whole group of youth advocates and they go to Albany, the state capital, and they visit city council people and they think of what are the policies because this isn't just a personal accident that happened to them. This is a, just incarcerating huge numbers of people, particularly people of color in this country is a, is a policy. And so we were very excited, which is that for nine years, these young people that we've been working with, for example, have been going to Albany asking to pass a law that says that the prison system should keep, keep parents in the prison closest to where their children are. Um, Rhode Island is relatively small, so you can't be that far from your, but New York is huge. We have uh, half of the women's, half, half the women in prison are 400 miles from New York City. And so after all of these years, these kids actually are getting this law changed. Um, and so it's really about empowering young people to see that they can make a difference, that they have a right to see their parents, they have a right to be taken care of. Um, I think that's been the most exciting thing about this work um, is establishing these kids as, as being an important component of this work. Um, and also just, yeah, I, I think that's, that's it. And also having their parents, frankly, and I thought it was really brilliant in the movie where Mason talks to his father, where the parents do have to take responsibility. They didn't just walk down the street doing nothing. They got there for a reason and yeah, their yeah. kids may be the only people that ever actually challenge them so that they can actually do the work to look inside themselves, which is what our programs are supposed to do yeah. and say, who was I? Why was I doing that? not because I remember my kids were like well if you'd loved me why would you do that and he had to answer no I did love you and I shouldn't have done that yeah yeah uh, do you uh, ha ever have occasion to use the film and the work that you do with Osborne yeah we 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 it's in two ways really um it it when we show it to the people who are in the system it it confirms again that they're not alone, right? That the various ways in which all of the young people in that film had three different, they were really different kids. Um, and it shows the complexity of the ways in which it, and so I think for the people that see it and particularly for the, the parents that see it, I think that they appreciate that. But as important as that is, I think the most important thing is when regular folks see this movie and realize 
who we have incarcerated and who is affected by it. That we don't think of people having families. They just don't imagine. Mm -hmm. um, oh, right, it's a father, it's a mom. And so I think that that is the m many benefits of the way we've used the film. But for me, when people like see it and go, oh my God, I never, I never really thought about what that was like for the kids. Yeah. That, when we end incarceration in this country, it's going to be because people saw the humanity behind bars and the impact on their children. I think you're probably very, very right. I was thinking about how moving, uh, it, how moving it was to watch Trey's father just break down, or Mason, you know, to, you, to, to listen to your dad um, respond to you when you were I'm trying to give him an out uh, that you know that maybe he hadn't really done anything wrong, and he. I, I, you know, to his credit, he stood firm. He said, no, you know, this, you know, I, I did do something wrong. It was, uh, uh, it's, it's incredibly humanizing and very, very important. So Mason, you are somebody who seems to be pretty well creatively endowed. Um, you have several different creative interests. Um, what's next for you? What, what, what do you hope to do? creatively in your life? Well, I hope to um, get into like a really good art school. Uh, the main one I always consider is RISD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'd like to get a bachelor's degree in animation so that I can actually get into the animation industry um, at some point after college. And I'd like to like, I'd like to Maybe pitch a show to like either Netflix or Cartoon Network and actually get my own like animated series. Um, that's right. something. So, yeah, and then not even just animation, I also have music. I'd like to like, I was like, I was like, the animation will be my main career mm -hmm. path, but on like the side, I was like, like, because like, I'll, I'll, they'll also be like backups, but um, like music, I'll be producing my own, I like to produce my own albums uh, at some point. And, um, I actually, I already make music on my computer, and uh, this actually this year for my birthday and Christmas, I've already mentioned it a bunch of times to my like family. But I've been thinking of asking for a guitar. <laughs> I, mean, I really want to learn to play the guitar. Pitch early and, pitch frequently. <laughs> what? Yeah. I said pitch pitch early pitch frequently to get that idea across. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I also love uh, writing. I've uh, actually this year I won a the, I won the Right Rhode Island State Writing Competition with a nonfiction un, uh, no not a, a fiction story I wrote uh, and I was one of three finalists within the entire state and um, I, I don't know won a few other writing awards as well and yeah so pretty much just well, congratulations all. yeah. Thank well, you. With, with your intelligence and your sensitivity, that, that's not surprising. But congratulations. Thank yeah, you. I told his grandmother that she's going to have to build another wing of the house for Mason's trophy his room. <laughs> <laughs> he's already got so many. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think we have any questions from uh, from our um, guests tonight. So let, I'm just going to just take a beat just to see if uh, any brave souls have some questions that they would like to ask. And let's see. Oh, okay. How um, one person wants to know how you got access to um, uh, to the warden and 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 access to do the filming that you did uh, at the facility, Denali. Um, that's a great question. Thank you to who asked that question um, because I think it's from William. Oh, hi, Dad. <laughs> uh, assuming that's my dad, but um, great question. I no, I think because it actually, in thinking about it, it's because they were really proud of this visiting program that they had. And I mean, it had been implemented for 20 years, um, but really, like, they were able to create it because it's a fairly small 
prison in a small state with really, really, you know, dedicated social workers who are very passionate about families and kids. And so um, they worked very hard to establish this visiting program and were able to get it into the men's facilities. Um, and while I was there, they were working on um, getting more of the programming into the women's facilities. But um, it's really unique across the country, as Elizabeth pointed out, you know, most visiting in prisons across the country are either behind glass or that you're sitting across the table from your parent, but you're not allowed to touch them, or you can hug once for a certain number of seconds, and then you will physically be pulled away, you know, and that, that becomes the traumatic experience for kids. It's not just that my parent is in prison, you know, that's traumatic in other ways, but to go in and see your parent and not be able to touch them, not be able to know physically that they're okay and that they, to hear that they still love you and have that, you know, physical bond and connection shown. And then beyond that, to have to go in and not just not be able to bond with them in ways that children bond by throwing balls across the room by you know, drawing like Mason and his dad did or playing cards or just, sit, you know, sitting and talking, but having that option to, to just in, hugging. interact in these other ways. So I think the facility was really, um, they recognize that this program is unique. And, you know, while I know that, you know, the Rhode Island Department of Corrections has um, some, some other areas of improvement, certainly, um, this was one thing that I think they just felt that I couldn't really, it would be hard to spin it in a negative light, let's say. And so there was a bit more leniency to allowing a camera crew in to, and then again, because the film was really through the children's perspective. Um, I mean, before I was just always surprised that they let me in really relatively easily. And if there was any kind of tussle, it was about continuing to come in for two years. You know, they're like, oh, you filmed for a weekend, you're good, right? You're, you can make your movie now. And um, so that was kind of a push and pull, but I think ultimately the perspective through the kids and, and really being able to highlight this really remarkable and, and visiting program that can be implemented in many other places if, if there's the will to, I think was really yeah. important for that reason. Uh, Sue, not me, but another Sue asks, um, uh, where are uh, Desan and Trey right now, and how are they doing? So they're both doing well. Um, Desan is, they're both still in Rhode Island. Desan is, if you can believe it, like t as tall, if not taller than me now. Um, he will be, his grandfather is like almost seven feet tall, so he's going to be very tall. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he's good. He's been, during um, the pandemic, he's been homeschooled which has been really great bonding experience for him and his mom. She said that he actually has skipped like two levels in math yeah. and they've been hiking a lot and doing a lot of outdoor activities. So I think it's just been really nice for them to have that time together. And, and for him, I mean, he's, he loves school and loves learning. And I think that having this time to really focus on that has been really good for him. Um, and Trey's also doing well. He's also in Providence. Um, he's been living with friends um, since he aged out of the um, foster care system. So, but he's got support. He's got, you know, community of people that are looking out for him. And um, he's really just, I'm so impressed with how much he's been able to overcome. And really by that, I mean that he is stable and talks about employment and has goals and plans and um you know we're in touch every week uh we have like a standing touch base on mondays so that i can make sure i know where he is um and then i'm also in contact you know he and his dad aren't really speaking very much right now they've obviously had a very complex relationship and as trey aged out of foster care i think a lot of that hit of like my dad's not here for me and i'm um, you know, I'm not going to take that initiative to go see him, which is also important that kid, you know, visiting is not also to force kids to go see their parents. Sometimes kids can make the choice not to, and that's okay too, um, as they work through a lot of that. So, yeah. Well, but, um, do you have a, do you know how much longer, um, 
Crazy Dad's sentences? Well, unfortunately, um, he's actually, so he was sentenced on to both federally and state, um, prosecuted in the state. So, and those sentences were consecutive. So he received 20 years from both the state and the federal government. Wow. So he um, is going up for parole this year, but then he'll be transferred to a federal facility and his has another 20 years. I don't think he'll serve all 20 of those years, but um, it's still quite a while. Um, but I've also been impressed, you know, with him that he's really, he's writing a lot. If you go to my Facebook page, I actually um, was able to record one of his poems that he wrote after George Floyd was murdered. Um, and um, so we've been kind of working together to get uh, I want to create a medium page for him and get some of his writing out there because he's really a powerful writer. And when he gets out, he really wants to open a barbershop that's also like a community space so that kids um, have a place to come and get a free haircut if they like read a book, you know, read out loud while they're getting their haircut. Or he has all these ideas um, about how to kind of both um, do what he loves, which is cutting hair and then making um, making a, sp a safe space for kids to come in and, and kind of get mentorship and and um, have have a support system. Just please give him our best as well. I, the scenes with between him and Trey, uh, uh, I, 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 I knew from what you said that it, it was a tough relationship, but there was just felt like there was a, so much love between them if they if hopefully they can they can find their way to each other yeah i hope so too i i think we probably just have time to uh deny i'm gonna ask you one last question but you've, you've sort of already talked about this a little bit but um but if in your dream world what would this film accomplish mm -hmm. well i think you know what elizabeth said earlier really sums it up. I think there's, it's twofold for me. Um, one is connecting with parents and kids. Um, mm -hmm. For parents that are incarcerated to be able to see, you know, what their kids' lives are like on the outside and also to have this kind of, um, you know, opening to talk and discuss their own feelings about their incarceration, about their relationships with their kids. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as a tool for the, the stakeholders and support systems for those parents to be able to show the film and, and open up those dialogues. Um, and then, you know, equally, if not more importantly, I think having this film seen by people who don't have experience with people in prison um, or for people that maybe do, but maybe it's been a negative experience and that's kind of colored their um, entire view of this population of people that are millions of people in our country um, and that the major majority of them if not mostly all of them are loving people who have made mistakes um, or you know are just caught up in these really really deep-rooted systems of in, in injustice and inequality and that these are parents and that they love their kids and their kids love them back. And so to, you know, to punish someone by saying you can't see your kids is ultimately hurting so many more people, um, you know, in, in those circles and that just reverberates out. And that goes beyond visiting. I mean, the amount of, and Mason's grandmother could speak to how much money she has spent on phone calls over the, the years on, you know, being able to purchase orthopedic shoes for his father, who's a diabetic, um, because he only makes $90 a month and can't afford, you know, the, the things that he needs to literally survive. And so I think when we, when we think about kind of the disparity between um, what you may think of incarceration being for maybe to right the wrongs or provide justice for something that's, you know, mistake or something that someone has done versus the actual collateral damage of that incarceration and, and the really inhumane way that people are treated and how that's 
not helping anybody heal or move past, you know, to, to come out and, and continue to live their lives is that's, that's what I think people can really see in this film. Um, and I think it's really important. It's, it's important that it be seen. I'll just share a very quick story. Uh, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to, to um, take our film in Ascente into a minimum security prison in New York. And, um, um, and I was surprised actually that the men were interested in watching this film. I think they had a choice between this and an action film, but, but I was pretty happy that they, they did. So we watched the film, it was 40 minutes long, and then broke into small groups to discuss it. And I would just preface this by saying that uh, prior to working at Shine, I was a college professor for 20 years. And um, so I was used to doing a lot of small group discussions after films. So I had a group that I was running and whatever. And I, I will never forget this. First of all, how comfortable I felt with these men and, and how, how intelligent they were. And I would, I would match the discussion that I heard that day uh, against any college class I have ever taught and, and, uh, and, and say with confidence that this discussion was of a higher order and, and, and greater sensitivity. And it was, it was a revelation to me to see that happen. So um, I, I just can only reinforce what you're saying, Denali. Uh, I, I think this takes us to the end of our program. I want to thank you, Elizabeth, so much, and Mason, and of course you, Denali. And can I ask, can I ask Elizabeth just one question about if there's anything happening right now in New York during the pandemic or any way that folks who might be in the area can help support. I know there was a letter to Cuomo about the visiting nearby recently, but just any kind of call to action right now? Well, interestingly, today or yesterday was the first day since March that visits were opened up in a limited way with uh, social distancing and masks and a boatload of sanitizer. Um, and uh, I saw a note from correction saying, well, we got complaints from both sides, so it must have worked. Um, <laughs> um, but it was horrible. Um, I, I think that being separated, very limited ability to, I mean, I think the department tried, they gave some free phone calls, but the separation was really hard. There was pressure on, I mean, prisons are Petri dishes. Kids are terrified about what's happening with their parents. Family members are very, very distraught. Um, the governor made a very little, tiny little, they, they released a couple thousand people 90 days early. People would have gotten out anyway. He did no commutations. They, uh, they've tried to separate folks. The only thing going for us is that 20 years ago, New York State had over 70,000 people in prison and today there's 37,000. So the ability to spread out a little is there, but um, prisons have a much higher rate of COVID illness and death than any other population in the country. And I think um, Mason can tell you, I mean, when you can't see somebody and talk to somebody, the fear about what's going on with my parents. I remember my kids w used to be terrified. So I can't imagine now in the middle of it. So a lot of public pressure by families who have organized themselves demanding to get back in and visiting. Uh, again, literally today or yesterday was the very first day in the maximum security prisons that it was allowed on a more limited basis. Um, and, but everything about it has been terrifying. Um, and New York, fortunately, um, has flattened the curve to some degree. This is three days with no deaths, um, while the rest of the country seems to be exploding. Um, but for people in, in some states, the, the COVID rate in prisons is the highest of, of anywhere. So it, it's, it's terrifying, especially for kids and families when you can't see somebody touch them. Um, and feel confident that they are okay, especially because 
you just imagine you're trying to make these phone calls and you're, you, you don't have sanitizer, you don't have ability, and then you're supposed to be on the same phone, using the same phone that the person just behind you used. Um, I mean, social distancing is a joke in prison. Yeah. So it's been rough. Yeah, it's a very sobering note to end on, um, uh, but a really important one. And um, yeah, and it just, I think it just really underscores the need for as a uh, compassionate set of policies as, as are possible to, to promote this, the, the, the relationships that those in prison need and deserve um, to have with their families and, and certainly their children really rely on that and, and, and deserve that as well. So thank you again so much. It's been a really wonderful and illuminating conversation. So 